All right, good morning, everybody. This is the uh, midst of a series we've been working through called Grounded. You know, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus gives an incredible teaching, he, he ends the Sermon on the Mount by saying, you know, if you listen to my words, it's like you build your life on a firm foundation. You build your life on the rock, and when the storm comes, your house is going to endure. He says, but if you build your house on the sand, it's not going to last. And so he encourages us to build our lives on him and to become grounded on, on Jesus' teaching. Now, what does it look like to be grounded and what parts of our life do we want to get grounded in? Well, in this series, we've been talking about getting grounded in our family, in our finances, in our faith, and with our friends. And today we're talking about being grounded in our faith. You know, in the book of Hebrews, it says that it is impossible to please God without faith because those who come to him must believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In other words, faith is the beginning of even what it looks like to begin to follow and please God in our lives. And in this series, as we've talked about getting grounded, we started out by talking about getting grounded in our, in our family. We talked about having glad hearts and what that looks like in our lives. Then we talked about uh, finances and we talked about you know, looking at what God's word says and what wisdom tells us we're supposed to do with our finances. And we talked about how dumb debt is a shortcut to regret. Today, as we talk about faith, there's a simple truth that we're going to find in one of the most timeless chapters of the whole Bible. One of the most famous scenes in all of the book of Proverbs, the very last of the Proverbs. And this is the simple truth that we're going to learn today. And that is that wisdom is a role model worth following. Now, what chapter is the last chapter of the book of Proverbs? It's Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31 is a famous uh, chapter in the Bible for a lot of different reasons, but one of them is, is because it's known as, the, it's known as the Proverbs 31 woman chapter. And it's an interesting thing to do, you know, if, if you've never done this, is that there are, in many months, there are 31 days. And you can read a proverb a day, every day of the rest of your life, and continue to read through the book of Proverbs. Uh, that just means on those days with, those months with 30 days, you just have to read two, uh, and you can get through the book of Proverbs. And then in February, you know, you just got to find some extra time to read a few extra chapters. But, you know, the, 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 the 31st chapter of the book of Proverbs is something I've heard all my life. Uh, I've heard, heard it at many a funeral of somebody when uh, a saintly woman passes away. Family, pastors will get up and they will say, this woman was a Proverbs 31 woman. And, what, and they begin to read and interpret the passage. One of the things that's interesting, though, that I think a lot of people don't realize is that when the book of Proverbs is being written and you get to the very end, the last chapter and the last verses of the book are recapitulating, they're retelling the story of what it looks like to be wise. And what they're doing is they're saying, listen, if you want to know what wisdom looks like, rather than me just tell you what wisdom looks like, I'm going to paint you a word picture. I'm going to personify wisdom for you as a woman. And so we, what we do is we look at the picture of the woman that's described in Proverbs chapter 31, and we learn not just what women should do or wives might do, but what we all can do. In fact, the 31st chapter of the book of Proverbs is about wisdom, and it is showing us wisdom as a role model that is worth following. Now, I don't know who your role models are today, but I think it's worth asking that question. Who is yours <laughs> when it comes to role models in your life? I mean, everybody at some point or another in their life probably thought to themselves, oh, this is a role model that I have. And I don't know who your role models are. I remember when I was young that my role models were mostly sports figures. You know, uh, when I played uh, baseball, I, I aspired to be some of the great baseball players. And when I played basketball in junior high and high school, I wanted to be like Mike. You know, I drank Gatorade and ate Wheaties, and I thought I could be Michael Jordan, too. That's all it takes, by the way. And so I had it all figured out. Turns out, though, that I didn't become Michael Jordan, but then when I learned to play golf, you know who I wanted to be like? I wanted to be like Tiger Woods. Man, these guys are great golfers, and these are great basketball players. But you know what I discovered? Is I discovered that on the court or on the course, they may be worth following, but sometimes in their life, they're not really a good role model. What you find in the 31st chapter of the book of Proverbs is somebody who is a good role model on and off the course. They are, they are a role model worth following through all of life. 
Now, as I knew this was going to be Mother's Day, I thought I would ask my kiddos, you know, who do you think the really great mom role models are? And they didn't really have a lot of good things to say. So then I said something like this. I said, who do you think television says some of the great role models are? And my kids looked at me and they said, well, we don't know because we don't watch TV. And that's a bit of a problem, right? You know that you're a part of a new generation when everything you watch is something you hold in your hand. And if it's not a short little video, you don't even know that it exists or it's not a movie. So my kids don't know about TV moms, but I grew up watching reruns of Leave It to Beaver, and I remember June Cleaver. Don't, don't you remember? How many of you remember June Cleaver, right? So I remember hearing moms talk about, well, I'm no June Cleaver, you know, like nobody could be like that, you know? But, you know, I, and so I thought it would be interesting to go and just look up who are the most well-known TV moms, and you know what? I found a list of 40 of them, of which I knew almost none of them myself. But I did notice the top two, and I did recognize that number two most familiar mom is the lady from the Brady Bunch. Remember her? We can put a picture of this lady up here. Uh, really well, well known, Brady. Uh, and she's the second most popular mom according to Movie Web. But this is what really surprised me, was that the most popular, most recognized TV mom isn't even a real mom, of course, neither are the other ones, but it's a cartoon mom from one of the longest running television shows on television. This mom had a really hard job. She had to raise a really bad kid named Bart, and her name is Marge Simpson, and the show is called The Simpsons. Did you know that that Marge Simpson is the most recognized? I mean, isn't that incredible? I mean, these are the role models that we aspire to in our culture today. It's pretty interesting, but when you ask the question, who are your role models? That's an interesting question. And what the book of Proverbs wants to do is it wants to tell us not just a role model for a mom or a wife, but a role model for all of us is this thing called wisdom. And so we begin in the first couple of verses of the proverb, which starts in verse 10 of Proverbs 31, and it says this, a wife of noble character. Now, right off the bat, I got to tell you that the word wife in Hebrew is the word Isha, and Isha is used all through the Bible to mean either a woman or a wife. Turns out in this particular case, we know that she is a wife, but it could just in general refer to a woman of noble character. The word noble, such an interesting word, hail in Hebrew. It means hail is this idea of something that's praiseworthy, something that's, that, that's recognizable. That's, it, said, uh, it said about Ruth, for example, that she is hail, that she is a noble Character. She is a noble person. A wife of noble character, who can find? If you read through Proverbs, it's always talking about wisdom as something you should search for, you should seek for, you should look for. She is worth far more than rubies. Now, the Bible always has trouble translating words like rubies because we don't know exactly what precious stones the authors had in mind when they wrote that. And you look at different translations, you'll see different words that are translated. For example, one translation even just says diamonds. And it means that it's worth as much as the most pricely thing you can find. It is, it is the most valuable thing that you could actually find in life. Now, as we start to read this, we have read it so many years as about a woman or about a wife. But remember, this is pers wisdom personified. In other words, wisdom is worth more than anything you can buy. It is the most expensive, most valuable thing that you can, you can pursue. Her husband has full confidence in her, lacks nothing of value. She brings him good and not harm all the days of her life. So what we're, we're introduced to is this really valuable, worthwhile, praiseworthy model, role model of life, which is wisdom. And it begins to be told to us what she does. What does she do? do? <laughs> well, let's walk through this proverb. If you've, you've probably read it before, some of you read it through many, many times, and as you read through it, sometimes you read it and you kind of go, you know, that's kind of interesting. That seems like a long time ago, and I don't know how to understand any of that. Well, let's walk through this together and see if we can understand some things about it, but if I could simplify it for you, and I kind of wish I had made my sermon this simple, it, it would have said something like this. This is what she does. She is successful, she is unselfish, and she is spiritual. 
Now, if you could just sort of say, what is this picture that we see in this passage? You will see that she is successful, she is unselfish, and that she is spiritual. But because the sermon needs to last longer than that, I want to tell you a little bit more about it. Okay? Number one, (laughs) I want to tell you that the first thing we see here is that she takes actions that add value. Now, we're already told that she is very valuable. Remember, we're talking about a woman, but we're really talking about wisdom. Wisdom, the thing that you should pursue above everything else in your life, will add value to your life, and it adds value through action. Jesus said that, Jesus talked about wisdom is proven right through her actions. Listen to the way we see this in the proverb. We pick up in verse 13 and 14. It says, she selects wool and flax, and she works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. Now, I'll be honest with you. I've read this passage through the years many, many times, never taken the time to really pay any attention to what that means and why that's important. And maybe, you have, maybe you're the same. You kind of think to yourself, what does wool and flax have to do with anything? Remember, wool was uh, come from sheep. You know, they shaved the sheep, and that's how they would make woolen garments. Well, when it says here, it speaks of flax, flax is a part of the process of making linen, among other things. In fact, we can put you a picture up here on the screen. I was fascinated by this. I ended up spending like an hour or more just researching how they take uh, the the, the product of flax and they translate it into, into linen garments and how they would make it into seeds and how they make it into oil. I didn't even realize I was putting that in my oatmeal every morning over the last several months. I didn't even know that. But you you take it and you take it through a process and you can see all the different pieces of that process. And when they, some of the seeds, they'll take that and you have flax seeds. And some of the seeds you press, you have oil. You take those those stalks and they, I've watched how they will take them and they, and it's a very slow and arduous process. They beat it and they, and they make it soft and then they, they wrap it up and then they are able to make it into, into linen garments, which were very valuable. All the Egyptian priests, for example, only, only wore linen garments. And by the way, if you don't think of linen being something useful today, sometime reach in your pocket and take out a dollar bill because it's made out of 75% cotton and 25%, guess what? Linen. Did you know that? You're carrying around money is literally linen. So what is being described here is very interesting. In the ancient world, one of the most valuable industries was the industry of taking agricultural products and then transferring them into items that could be bought and sold for money. One of the leading industries of the ancient world was the production of linen garments and linen cloth. And so as it starts to describe this woman, just like it talks about about her, which is wisdom, as rubies, it starts to talk to us about one who is brings incredible financial value in terms of wool and flax. And then we're told she has like, she's like a merchant ship. And you kind of read that and you kind of think, what in the world is that? If you've never seen one, this is a, this is an actual drawing of an actual ship. They uncovered it. They found it. Archaeologists did. They dug it up and they, and you saw what, what it looked like. And then they painted it so you could see the inside of it. This is an ancient Phoenician ship from the same time period. What a Phoenician ship did, a merchant ship did, is it took goods from one place and brought them to another. And on that ship were the most valuable things that could be bought and sold. A merchant ship was one of the most profitable ways of going about business in the ancient world. In other words, what's being described here is the very height of a financial success. Success is being portrayed for us in a very uh, ordinary fashion. She adds value through her actions. But not only through her actions is she giving us the picture of success, but she makes decisions that add value. It's not just actions, it's decisions. And you start to read it in this proverb, we pick up in verse 15 through 18. It says, she gets up while it's still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. She doesn't just buy it, she considers it, right? She, she knows how to make good decisions. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She knows how to do that and knows which one to get and so on. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her task. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. Now, I think there's a lot of things in this verse you could pay attention to, but the decision to buy a vineyard is pretty significant. Uh, you know, in the, in the, in the, the, that part of the world, Israel, is, is much of it is a desert. 
And so it's really quite remarkable that we would see in the story uh, that she is able to produce vineyards, buy a vineyard and build a vineyard. It's a, it's a whole process. Today in Israel, there's now over 300 wineries, which is incredible considering where they were just a few decades ago. It's just kind of a desert. They're reconstituting their agricultural society there. If you were to go to the Judean Hill country, you'd see this, the beautiful Shishora vineyards. And it's an example how uh, this part of the world can be cultivated. Not anybody can do this, but this, this wisdom, this woman of wisdom knows how to buy this. Now, again, why is this important? Because the vineyard was one of the leading agricultural products to produce economic value that is added. Uh, it, they used grapes. They made wine. They sold the wine. They were on the merchant ships. And again, this is a picture that's showing the way that value is added both through action and through decision. It's a picture of material success. Now, it also mentions in the passage that the lamp doesn't go out. In case you don't know what lamps looked like 3,000 years ago because they don't sell them at Walmart anymore. Uh, we can put a picture, I think, of a 3,000-year-old lamp. Uh, this is literally 1,000 B.C. Iron Age oil lamp. Not a whole lot to it. You put a little bit of oil in there and you light it up. And that is the equivalent of all the light you need, I guess, to do the task. We would say today something like this. She burned the midnight oil, right? It just kept on going. It's a picture of... Of, of material success. But then it goes on to say this in verse 19. In her hand she holds the distaff and she grasps the spindle with her fingers. This is a spinning is what it's kind of known as and we know from the ancient world people doing this. This relief we can put up here on the screen shows you a depiction from again 3,000 years ago. This is actually from eight, the 8th century BC of someone doing this process in the Middle East, and gives you an idea of what it looked like. But in case you can't see that picture well enough, we have another one we can show you, which is the distaff and the spindle. So you, the, 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 in the agricultural process, you gather up the flax, then you sort of beat it until it gets soft, and then it turns into this big old huge mess of fabrics, and you move it from the, spin, from the distaff, and you spin it until you get thread. And it sure is nice once it's in thread form, because then you can start to make it into fabric. It's an incredibly cumbersome process. To know how to do that and to go about doing that and then to do that successfully is way more than a one-person job, let's be honest. This is an, this is an entire industry. In fact, a, a more recent picture we can put up here is the painting known as the spinner borrowed from this ancient story. And it's an example of the way that through her actions and through her decisions, she both this woman in the story and wisdom adds value. So you could say that there's a kind of worldly success there. But the other thing that is incredible in the story is here wisdom is portrayed as a woman who is incredibly successful. I mean, she's like a merchant ship. She's worth more than diamonds. I mean, she's the leading, she's on the cutting edge of the, of the leading part of, of commercial society in the ancient world. I mean, incredible picture of wisdom. But then she's not just successful, she's unselfish. Which, by the way, I don't know about you, I know a lot of people in this world who are very successful from, a, from the perspective of worldly wisdom. And they, they, I mean, you can look at them and go, wow, you sure are wise. Look, look at all you've done. But then you look at the other part of their life, and they're not really a role model because you know why? They're very, very Selfish. Ask them to do something, give of their time, their talent, their treasure. Oh no, I can't spare any of that. But she who is wisdom personified, look what it says about her. She acts with compassion at her own expense. Kind of reminds me of a story Jesus told one time about a, about a good Samaritan. This is what it says in verse 20. She opens her arms to the poor. And she extends her hands to the needy. Now, I don't know if you've ever read this, you thought to yourself, how in the world does she have time to do that? I mean, come on, she's got a spindle in one hand and so on. I mean, how, she's over here doing vineyards and merchant ships and all this kind of stuff. Well, again, this is a personification of wisdom. But it, what is being personified here is generosity. It's unselfishness. It's a person who is very busy about being successful in life, but does not overlook the needs of other people. Always being aware of other people. Wisdom is always compassionate. Jesus shows us that so many times throughout so many of the scriptures. 
But not only that, we see it here in the fact that she makes preparations for more than just herself. You're going to see in this passage that difficult times are going to come, but she is going to be prepared, not just for herself, but for others, including her family. Look what it says in verse 21 through 25. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. Not rags, but scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She's clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. If you don't know what that looks like, go read the book of Ruth because it's a big part of the story there. She makes linen garments and she sells them. She supplies the merchants with sashes. She's clothed with strength and dignity. And one of my favorite lines in all of the Proverbs, she can laugh at the days to come. It starts by telling us when it snows. It doesn't snow very often in Israel. We can show you a picture of the western wall, the wailing wall with snow on the ground. Occasionally it does. I guarantee you, though, it only snows in one season of the year, and it's not summer because it's real hot in the summer. When it does it snow? In the wintertime. Now think about this. When it snows means when the cold comes in. She's not surprised by it. She's not alarmed by it. She's made preparation. She has no fear of it because she is prepared for the hard times. Not just for herself. Remember, this was a time when there wasn't Walmart and Target and Dillard's and Amazon where you can buy a coat when it gets cold. If you didn't make it, you didn't store it, then you didn't have it. And what's worse is not only did you not have it, but your kids didn't have it, your family didn't have it. And in those days, they didn't have indoor heating. <laughs> and so if you didn't have make preparations, people died. And so what we see in this story is this, this is a person who's not just successful and able to do all of these things, but it's a person who cares so much about others, the poor that she meets, and those who cannot unless she makes preparations for them. She provides more than just for herself. She is not only successful, she is unselfish. And then I love what it says next. She understands the value of words and she uses them wisely. The book of Proverbs is all about wisdom, but we wouldn't know it if somebody didn't write it down and somebody didn't say it. Wisdom is not just what we do. Wisdom is also found in our mouth. And listen to what the Proverbs says in verse 26. She speaks with wisdom. Faithful instruction is on her tongue. We live in the age where people are talking all the time. Turn on the television, 24 hours a day, you can hear the commentary from people talking about anything whose only job is just paid to talk. What they say doesn't really matter. They're just paid to talk. They're pundits and commentators. We live in a world in which people are constantly saying things. I mean, word vomit is, a, is a, its own terminology now. And, 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 and words don't even mean anything to a lot of people. They can just say something and just say, well, I, I just said that. It doesn't really matter. But listen, with with wisdom, she not only takes action, not only makes decisions, not only acts with compassion, but you can count on the words she says being true. When you're a wise person in your life, you're not only moving in the direction of, of worldly success and selflessness, but people can count on the things that you say. You've taken the time to not only say them, but to say them as they are right. And then it says this about her. She cares for her family, and she values her, and they value her care. That's a beautiful thought on this Mother's Day, isn't it? She not only cares for her family, but her family values her care. It says in verse 27 and 28, she watches over the affairs of her household, and she does not eat the bread of idleness. That's an interesting English translation right there, very well-known phrase. Her children arise, and they call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her which is what we're told in the beginning, is that she is noble, she is of worth, she is hail, she is praiseworthy. Now, all of these things in this chapter are amazing, and many people are familiar with some of these things. But do you know what lies underneath all of it? Her success and her unselfishness is her spirituality. What lies underneath all of it is it is undergirded under the firm foundation, grounded on her faith in God. Everything she does is undergirded, undergirded by her faith in God. Listen to the way it describes her in verses 29 through 31. Many women do noble things. All right, this is not a, this is not a shocker. You go around, you could find somebody doing some noble things, but you surpass them all. 
Charm is deceptive. Beauty is fleeting. Now that's something our culture doesn't really seem to get, does it? But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And there's that word again, to be praised. She is noble. She is hael. She is a person who is worthy of, of, of acclamation, of, of recognition. A woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done. And let her works bring her praise at the city gate. That was the place of great prominence in the ancient world. Let it be said of her in, this, in, in that way. Underneath everything in her life is her faith. In fact, this is what is, is not about this woman. It's about wisdom, isn't it? That wisdom begins in a place of faith. That the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom is the first chapter of Proverbs. And we said before that the fear of the Lord is not to be scared of God. It is to have an awe of God. James tells us it starts with an ask of God. If anybody lacks wisdom, ask, and God will give it to you. Solomon did that. He said, give me a listening heart, a Shema Lev. I want to hear. I want my heart to be able to hear from you. Wisdom is somebody who lives their life constantly with a, with a listening heart toward God. And all of God, ask, oh, God, speak to me. Let me, my life be shaped in the way that you, I'm not going to ignore the needs of people as I'm going about the busyness of my life. I have compassion in my heart for others. I make preparations and take care of those that I have a responsibility to take care of. But underneath everything is this rock solid foundation of faith in God. And when the storms of life come and go, that is the foundation. Isn't it something that says that she can laugh at the days to come? I know people who don't laugh at the days to come. I hear it all the time. People, they're afraid of the days to come. They're worried what's going to happen. Oh, pastor, did you see what was in the news? Oh, pastor, did you see what's going to happen in the economy? Oh, did you hear about this thing over there? But the person of wisdom, they don't live with fear every day of their life. They're grounded in the faith, the rock-solid faith in God, and they can laugh at the days to come. Not like a fool laughs at it, but they can laugh with the confidence that they know who and what the foundation of their life is. Here's a question today for you. As we think about what it means to be grounded, what will you do? What will you do in your life? Will you ground your life in the rock-solid foundation? Will you put your faith and trust squarely in God? And if you did, what would, it, what would it look like in your life if you did that? You know, this passage tells us what would it look like. It paints a picture of the enormous benefits of, of wisdom. It describes the success of wisdom in our life. Our culture constantly teaches us a different message. It, it teaches us the message of instant gratification. We looked at that last week when we talked about debt. It teaches us a culture of selfishness. Everything in our culture says it's all about me, myself, and I. We are the selfie generation. We are a culture that is obsessed with ourselves. Buy now and borrow and pay later and then live with regret. But ultimately, this worldview of our culture is a worldview of regret. Wisdom says there's real reward. It is the path to material benefits, but lasting benefits, and not just for ourselves, but for our family, for our friends, for our church, for our community, for our culture. The culture teaches we should strive for the appearance of perfection, but wisdom teaches us another message. It tells us in this proverb very famously and very importantly, charm is deceptive. And beauty is fleeting. But a woman, or you could say it like this, but wisdom, a person of wisdom who fears the Lord is to be praised. Now, all of this is from the Old Testament, and somebody's going to come up to me afterwards and say, well, pastor, that's all in the book of Proverbs, the Old Testament. You didn't say anything about what Jesus says in the New Testament. Jesus had a brother named James. He wrote a whole book in the New Testament, a book of wisdom called, get ready for this, the book of James. And it is, it's a whole book of wisdom. I challenge you, go home and read it. And you'll start to read it and you'll go, wow, this sounds like the book of Proverbs. And then you read the Sermon on the Mount and you say, wow, this sounds like Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. It's almost like they were all reading from the same page of notes. It's almost like the same God inspired all these words and they're all woven together somehow. It's almost like it's a miracle of inspiration. Well, that's what we believe in, isn't it? We believe that it was inspired by God. And you listen to what it says in the book of James. 
He says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith and has no deeds? Oh, he's talking about what we're talking about today, faith and deeds. Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. Oh, he's talking about what we were just reading about. If any of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does, not, does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? Sounds very similar, doesn't it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have deeds. <laughs> you got to love that. Well, you know, you, you have faith, but I have deeds. We live in a culture like that, don't we? That is our world in this, in this country. There are a lot of people who say they have faith, but they have no deeds. They go to church every Sunday, but there's nothing demonstrated in their life. Then there's a culture of people who never go to church, but they live their whole life trying to make the world a better place. And they look over at Christians and they say, hey, you Christians... Why aren't y'all over here doing good stuff? Listen to what James is saying when he, when he talks about this. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds. Show me how much you believe in God, but I can't see it in the actions of your life. And I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is a one God? Good. Even the demons believe it and shudder. Congratulations. You believe in God? Great. But does God's and your belief in God, your fear of God, your faith in God, undergird all of your life in such a way that it actually results in action? Because as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, wisdom is proven right by our actions and faith without deeds is dead, and it is impossible to please God unless we believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Faith is where we get grounded for all the storms we face in life. What about you today? Is it time for you to get grounded? What would happen in your life if you walked out of here today grounded? And that tomorrow and next week and next month and next year and what happens in the election or what happens in the economy or what happens in the Middle East or what happens in your life, none of that shakes you beyond your faith because your faith is grounded. Think about what that would look like for you. Think about what that would look like for your family. Think about what that would look like for our church. What if all of us would walk through life grounded? What if we drove out of here the situations that happened outside of our control didn't rock, sh shape, or shift our faith in any way, shape, or form because we were grounded. Well, I want to encourage you today to take a step of faith in the direction of that. Now, now the truth is, is for a lot, of, a lot of us, the only reason that we're not doing this is because we don't really want to do the thing that I've said through this whole series we have to do. We have to admit we need it. See, our pride always gets in the way. <laughs> oh, Pastor, that sermon's for somebody else. No, it's for you today. Are you grounded in your faith and in God? Are you grounded so that when the storms of life come, your faith in God is not shakable? Are you grounded? He said, all right, I, honestly, I'm not. We gotta start there. We have to admit that. And then the Bible says we gotta ask God. And then God will give to us what we ask. Now, by the way, that's a message for Christians, but that's also a message for people who are not Christians. If you're here today, you're watching, and you're saying, what does that mean for me? Do you know that's also the path to becoming a believer in Jesus? The path is when we admit our own shortcomings and our own failures, and to say, okay, God, we admit our shortcomings and failures, and we ask you to come and save and redeem and deliver us from all that we've done wrong and to make us right with you, to put our faith and trust in you. And we begin a relationship with you that'll last forever. And then you know what the Bible says? We're grounded. Let's pray. Father, on this Mother's Day, we read the, one of the most ancient proverbs that describes wisdom personified as a woman, a wife of noble character. And Lord, today we've learned that this beautiful book of Proverbs has, shows us through actions and through decisions, through acts of compassion. And through all of these things, and then underneath it all is the foundation of our faith, what it means 
to be wise, what it means to really be the person that we should want to strive to be. But Lord, that place starts and ends with faith. And so as we finish our sermon, may the sermon not be finished with us today. As we go from this place, as we go into Bible studies or we go and we eat lunch with family, as we go about the course of our week this week, as we go to celebrate Mother's Day or we go to grieve and mourn, as we go through whatever life presents us, whatever storms we face, God, may we rest securely on the rock-solid foundation and be grounded on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand this morning? We're going to continue to worship. I'll be here at the front. This is our invitation. It's a chance for you to respond to the message you've heard today. If God's saying today is the day you need to take a step of faith, begin that journey of following Jesus, I'd love to share with you how you can take those steps. I'll be right here. If you're here and you'd like to be a part of the life of the church, maybe you'd like to join our church, we encourage you to also do that. People don't mind to move out of the way. If you want to come down here and say, today's the day. I need to make a decision to join the church. Also, I share this every single time. In the hallway after the service, I'll be out here. And every Sunday, it seems like somebody comes up and says, I'd like to make some decision to join the church or to make some other decision in their life. And we encourage you to respond in that way as well. You come as the Lord leads you.